Okay, uh, welcome comrades to today's meeting of the Oxford Communist Corresponding Society. Um, I believe everybody has been to at least one meeting before, so uh, very briefly, uh, Ian is going to give a talk today, the title Hegelian Contradiction and the Prime Numbers, Part 2. Um, he'll talk for 20 minutes or possibly slightly longer. And then there will be an opportunity for direct questions and then uh, discussion. Uh, so, Ian, do you want to proceed? Yeah, thanks, Zed. Thank you very much. Um, I think you, you were here last time. So, oh, great. That's fantastic. So, um, let's just get started. Uh, so, prime numbers are whole numbers that can only be divided by themselves or one. They're special in two ways. Um, we can't make them by multiplying any other whole numbers together and we can make all the other whole numbers by multiplying together some unique combination of primes. So we can think of prime numbers as the elementary atoms of multiplication, these are the simplest possible entities of the number system. And you might think that's of purely mathematical interest but really the structure of the primes manifests um, everywhere. So say I give you 45 pebbles and ask you to arrange them in a rectangle. Uh, no problem, you can assemble a 9 by 5 rectangle of pebbles. If I give you two more pebbles and ask you to assemble a new rectangle, then no matter how hard you try and for how long, you'll never be able to construct such a thing because it's impossible because 47 is a prime number and um, it can't be broken down into a multiple of two numbers. So now I'd like you to imagine the infinity of the whole numbers uh, stretched out horizontally on the number line. Uh, and if we look, we will find an infinite number of primes growing like weeds amongst the ordinary numbers. The spaces between the primes aren't uniform. Sometimes the gaps are small and sometimes they're really big and they appear at irregular intervals. In fact, the gaps tend to get astronomically bigger the higher and the higher we go along on the number line. However, there are always uh, short gaps. So right now, early 2019, uh, mathematicians know that there are infinitely many primes that only differ by 246. So the gaps get bigger and bigger and bigger, tendency, but there's always small gaps. In fact, there may be even smaller gaps than that all the way to infinity. So um, this is um, very irregular. Uh, and the reason for this disorder is in one sense perfectly clear and transparent. Um, early Greek mathematicians uh, specified a very simple algorithm called the sieve of Eratosthenes um, that generates the, uh, the gaps. So you can program this on a computer. And so the simple rule that generates this disorder is entirely transparent. However, when we take a step back and look at the overall distribution of the primes and their gaps, we find, or we seem to find, extreme regularity and order. And that's when things start to get a lot less simple. So to make that order very clear, let's construct a prime staircase. Um, so as we travel along the number line, we'll create a step whenever we hit a prime number or a power of a prime number. So we'll create a step at two, at two squared, which is four, at two to the power two cubed, and two to the power four, and so on. Create steps at all those points. Similarly, steps at three, three squared, three cubed, and so on. Could, could you just say what you mean by step? I mean, literally, as we go along the number line, we'll jump up a step. As we, one, one unit, sure. Um, I'll just explain that in one second. So there'll be steps, but good question. The steps are of different size. So the height of the steps um, will be um, uh, the, the height of the step at each, each event when we hit a prime or a prime power will be the log of the prime. So the steps at 2, 2 squared, 2 cubed will be log of 2, which is about 0 0.7. The steps at 3, 3 squared, 3 cubed and so on will be log 3, which is about 1.1. So this new prime stair this prime staircase is a function, it's called the Chebyshev function. So on the handout, here it is, or at least here's a tiny, tiny part of it. 
and this is what it looks like. And it seems uh, the red, the blue line is the um, staircase. Red line is a straight line, obviously. Um, and the staircase seems to approximate a perfect straight line. So at the micro level, uh, the primes are irregularly spaced. Uh, there's disorder, but when we zoom out at the macro level, there seems to be almost uh, perfect order. And we can't check all the way to infinity with computers. Uh, so if this, if this straight line law holds, we need to prove it mathematically. But proving this law required nothing less than a revolution in the methodology of number theory. So uh, number theory uh, studies properties of discrete magnitudes, and it's as old as civilization itself. And up to about the 17th century, mathematicians employed elementary methods in their proofs that basically employed basic operations of arithmetic. But the discovery of the calculus by Newton and Leibniz starts to change that. So in the 19th century, mathematicians realized that methods that apply to continuous magnitudes, uh, such as differentiation, integration, also applied to number theory, and in fact were more powerful. Uh, and this so, so the modern field of analytic number theory was born. And the mathematician, uh, Bernard Riemann, am I pronouncing that right? Um, wrote a paper in 1859 where he used the techniques of analytic number theory to study the primes in an entirely new way. He constructed a special kind of uh, viewing device called the zeta function, which revealed uh, hidden properties of primes. So um, it's on the uh, handout, but it's worth writing out. Uh, this is one way of writing Riemann's Riemann's uh, zeta function. So there's this kind of factor at the beginning, and there's this infinite sum, infinite sum of this alternating sign over n to the power of s, s is a parameter. So the meaning of this equation will hopefully become a bit clearer as we go along. Uh, the first thing to note, though, is that um, we feed the zeta function a complex number. Um, it then performs some computations and hands it a complex number back. And complex numbers, uh, you recall, have an ordinary part, a real part, <coughs> and an imaginary part, a so-called imaginary part, which is a multiple of the square root of minus one. So uh, an example of a complex number would be three plus four i, where i is the square root of minus one. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated function. Uh, and so we can think of the inputs and the outputs of the zeta function as points on the complex plane. And so this function basically moves any points on the complex plane to a new point on the complex plane. And um, if you look at this part of the handout here, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, what Riemann discovered, if this is the input complex plane, and if I draw a point here, then on the output complex plane, it would be somewhere here. If I draw a point here, it might be here. And here, it might be here. And what Riemann discovered is that some special values, let's say this one, maps to the uh, zero point. Um, in the complex plane at zero, zero. Um, in fact, the first... These thing, are some values of s. The some values of s, exactly. Yeah. Some input values of s. And here's, a, here's one of them. Uh, this s, uh, about 14.1 i. If you put that into there, you get out zero. And those points are called the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function. So, on the handout, well, what we've got here is um, some blue input points. They happen to be in a straight line. Uh, so we're not worried about the moment. And the red is the actual output numbers. And then on the right side, so I zoom into that red thing. And what we find is that straight line gets changed into a spiral, some kind of spiral. So um, Riemann knew that there are an infinite number of such zeros. Uh, but he could only calculate 
a handful uh, by hand, manually, uh, we can easily compute more with computers. There's, the, there's some more. So basically, if, if this is the z to output, oh, it goes on forever. It goes on forever, and an infinite number of times, at certain special points, it will go through a zero. That's a zero. The input value that outputs a zero is called a zero. So this is all very pretty, but, you know, so what? And this is where we get to the, the crucial point. Uh, Riemann discovered by... Um, uh, he discovered a remarkable fact. Um, the location of the zeros of the zeta function encodes the distribution of the prime numbers. And, uh, and in the sequence of remarkable mathematical uh, arguments, he derived a formula for the Chebyshev prime staircase that we looked at a second ago. And this is also worth um, writing out in full. So using the zeta function, we've got an explicit formula. This is the phi of x is the Chebyshev prime staircase. x is as we go along the number line. This will give us the staircase output, x minus an infinite sum over rho, x to the rho divided by rho, minus log of 2 pi. It's on the handout. Um, the rows are the infinite number of zeros of the zeta function. So we can, we can ignore this term, this is a constant term, because as x has gone on the number line, it gets bigger, this gets bigger, this gets swamped, forget about that. Now, if the straight line law was absolutely true, perfectly true, we'd have prime staircase equals x. As we go along, let's go, let's go along. we don't we have this extra infinite sum. Uh, of the uh, zeta zeros. And what that means is that the zeta zeros control the magnitude of the fluctuations of the primes and their powers around that straight line law. And so now we can directly relate um, zeta zeros to primes and their powers. Oh, sorry, we cannot directly relate a single zeta zero to a prime or its power. It doesn't work like that. All the zeta zeros collaborate in producing these steps in the staircase. All the zeta zeros collaborate to generate all the fluctuations of all the primes. So it's not that simple. <coughs> and so the zeros tell us about the, how far the Chebyshev staircase deviates from a straight line all the way to infinity. So the more we know about the zeros and where they live, the more we understand about how the primes grow like weeds amongst the ordinary numbers. But there's a problem, because as of today, right now, mathematicians simply don't know where all the zeros live. They can't work it out. <clears throat> it's really hard to find out where these zeros really live. So, Riemann did know, however, roughly uh, where they live. And if this is the input complex plane... Um, and this is zero, this is zero, this is about one, this is a half. He knew that all those important zeros, the non-trivial zeros, live in what's called this critical strip. It goes all the way down here, all the way up here. Half, between zero, one, and a half is in the middle. Somewhere there, all the zeta zeros must lie. But it wasn't until 1896, some 30 years after Riemann first wrote his paper, that mathematicians actually proved that no zeros could possibly exist on this line and this line. And that proved for alone, that was sufficient information um, to prove that the distribution of the primes is indeed governed by a straight line law. And this proof is known as the prime number theorem. And it's a crowning achievement of analytic number theory. Uh, so at the micro level, the primes are disordered. Uh, but at the macro level, they approximate a simple straight line law. And the prime number theorem means that this law necessarily holds all the way to infinity. And it was Riemann's zeta function 
that was the key to unlocking this hidden order in the primes. <clears throat> so at this point, I want to start asking some questions. Um, so Riemann's new way of studying the primes is mathematically unambiguous. But what this new way of looking is, and why it should prove so effective, is much more uh, mysterious. Even mathematicians aren't exactly sure why the zeta function encodes information about the distribution of the primes. Only that it does. But uh, you know, why does it? Uh, why is the zeta function uniquely successful in, in <coughs> encoding knowledge about the primes? And why can continuous magnitudes and imaginary numbers tell us new things about ordinary whole numbers? So to try to answer these questions, let's now get back to uh, some Hegel. So Hegel's uh, science of logic, you might recall from last time, uh, claims to reveal the uh, necessary structure uh, of anything that exists at all, either in physical reality or, or in the mind. And Hegel calls this necessary structure a determinate being or, or becoming. And previously we developed a mathematical model of becoming as a 2D system of coupled differential equations. And I call this model Hegel's contradiction since it's a dynamic unity of uh, being and nothing. And so, just as a reminder, I think I need to draw it. So, I won't go over the philosophical justification for this structure. Let's just remind ourselves of the model x, y. This is something, this is nothing. <coughs> interact via some equations. <coughs> Being affirms nothing. Nothing negates being. So this is the Hegelian contradiction. Okay. So what I want to, what I plan to do is to take uh, Hegel at face value and assume that he's right. Uh, everything is indeed ultimately composed of Hegelian contradictions. So in consequence, the integers, which are those paragons of perfect immutable objects that are impervious to time, exhibit no changes whatsoever, it must be contrary to appearances, fundamentally dynamic objects with internal contradictions that cause them to change and move. So the integers must also be Hegelian contradictions. And on the face of it, that obviously seems uh, insane, uh, but this is what Hegel's logic implies. So we're just going to go for it. So let's start this experimental line of thought by defining what a Hegelian integer uh, might be. So last time we had one kind of contradiction, but now we need to start distinguishing different kinds. And... This is something I think you raised last time, actually, which I glossed over, so now it becomes uh, important. Uh, this contradiction has two properties. It has essentially the rate or speed at which being and nothing react to each other. And the overall activity level, or the quantity of substance that flows within it. Those are two properties it has. And then different contradictions, I'm going to say, have a, a different, are distinguished by those two properties. So I want to define a, a Hegel number, which I'll call H omega for now, where omega is its number, and H means it's a, a Hegel number, uh, as having a reaction speed omega. So this, instead of being 1, becomes omega y. And this, instead of being 1, becomes minus omega y. So bigger omega, smaller omega. <laughs> um, so, for instance, the Hegel number two will move um, twice, as, um, twice as fast as Hegel number one. And um, the system of equations um, that define this contradiction are exactly the same as last time, <coughs> except we have this omega value. Um, and as we discussed last time, you may recall... Um, Although being and nothing oscillate over time as they interact with each other, they nonetheless obey a conservation law. 
and I want to, for simplicity, call this substance that's conserved the size or, or the scale of the contradiction, uh, because it relates directly to the quantity of substance that's flowing through it, how big being and nothing can get as the oscillator. Uh, so how big should any particular Hegel number be? And I want to postpone this decision and simply declare that it's determined in some yet-to-be-specified way by uh, omega. And it just so happens that there's initial conditions, if you recall, I've got to set some initial conditions. Last time I said that time zero, nothing is nothing. And at time zero I had uh, being is one. Uh, now I'm going to say it's not one, it's some function of omega. Uh, and that, in fact, for reasons I don't want to go into, will define the, the scale for all time, the contradiction, this initial condition. And, um, in fact, I'm going to smuggle in an extra parameter here, which we'll talk about later. Uh, hopefully become clearer later. Um, so that's it. Um, we've defined... Hegel number. So ordinary number omega, I'm going to represent as the Hegelian number h omega. And that, that's it. That's what we're doing. Uh, so I think it might be useful to look at some examples. Um, of the uh, of the number as it evolves in time. I don't know if you can see this, but remember it was a, a circle in phase space? Well, that's the circle in phase space, and that's H1, and it's, and it's basically, this, this is the oscillation of being nothing at the time. Uh, I want to show you H2, it's, sm it's smaller and faster. Uh, because I have to, to, to animate one, I have to choose a function from here. <laughs> it could be anything at the moment, I'm not saying what it is. But it's not. They move, uh, they move. Right. Um, so, ordinary uh, numbers can be added, subtracted, multiplied, divided, and so on. So, what kind of operations could we perform on, on Hegelian numbers? And there's many possible operations we could perform, uh, but here I want to focus on just one which I hope you will allow me to call uh, the sublation operator. And um, on the handout, there here's two Hegel numbers, ready to be sublated. Um, and what I want to do is, is sort of metaphorically add these two numbers together, uh, and that means creating a new causal structure of being and nothing. And there are many possible ways of combining these contradictions. Um, but we need a way that's consistent with Hegel's method and also to do to reproduce the same kind of moves that uh, he made in his original deduction of being nothing and then becoming. So this is um, one Hegel number. I got that right. That was right. Here's our second Hegel number. Which Different, different individual. Um, so we need to ensure that being always passes over into nothing. So let's add a connection here. That being passes into that nothing. Nothing always passes into being. Add that connection. Uh, being always affirms nothing. So this has a positive direction. Don't know what that is yet. Uh, nothing always negates being, so this has a negative direction. We don't know what that is yet. We also want this higher sublated unity to preserve its components as moments. And we also want this higher unity to, uh, to use Hegel's language, put an end to its components, uh, but also manifest new properties not reducible uh, to its components, so that you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. What should these values be? Um, well, it turns out in order to satisfy the last two principles I mentioned, preservation and um, what was it? 
preservation and new properties. Um, I need to choose the values to be a function of the two component numbers. Take it from me, that's what I need to do. Um, so now we've got new connections and we've got new connection reaction rates between these two numbers. And so we get this new causal structure, which is here, I've also drawn it on the board, sublated unity of two Hegel numbers. And what that does is actually define a 4D system of differential equations, which I, reasons that I won't write it, write it out, it just gets long-winded, but it's now a 4D system. Um, <coughs> and the behaviour of this sublation has a reasonably simple form. In this unity, omega-1, H omega-1 behaves just as an isolated H omega-1, that's preserved in that sense. And H omega 2 in this unity is a superposition of the dynamics of each individual component. And in fact, um, if we define the resultant behavior as the um, behavior, the last component in the sublation, the resultant behavior, this is what I plotted here, this is what we get. Uh, that's, in fact, an example of adding, sublating rather, um, H2 and H4. Uh, Five, I believe. Yes. Now, um, isolated Hegel numbers, very simple pattern because we traverse perfect circles in being nothing space. But their sublating unity is more complex. Um, it's more, it's like an interesting repeated pattern in this case. Uh, and, and Hegel states in his logic that sublation both preserves and maintains its components and puts an end to them. So clearly this sublation operator introduces new properties. It behaves differently. Uh, but what, in what sense does it preserve its components? And that becomes obvious when we decompose the resultant trajectory into the component numbers. And this one is worth... Maybe, maybe you could pass that around and pass it all the way back to me without trying to touch the screen. But the, the, blue, the blue line is H... Uh, the H2, I think. The orange line is H5, and they're joined together. Um, but both, in fact, within the bigger structure, um, are traversing perfect circles, basically. They're partly preserved. As they're joined together, the dynamics of the position of those things are more complicated. So this sublation operator um, preserves its component contradictions. It also produces a qualitatively new ceaseless unrest, if you remember that phrase of Hegel from last time. There's repeated fluctuations of being nothing, never settles down. But it's also a quiescent result because it's a bounded increased trajectory um, um, phase space. The one thing I want to say about these particular animations is it can be um, just not don't confuse the map with the territory. This sublation is not moving in space, and its components are not rotating. What we really have is essentially this causal structure um, here, with four components, which it might be nice to think of them as light. The lights get brighter or darker, it pulse, it wax and wane. And I think that's, a, that's, a better, that's just a way of us helping us to think about this waxing wing of <coughs> lights that he's known. That's a geometric kind of viewpoint on this causal structure, how it behaves over time. Uh, so why, why stop here? We can sublate the sublation. In other words, repeatedly apply the same sublation operator as many times as we want and to any combination of Hegel numbers. Each time we apply the same, the same principles and attach a new number to the existing sublation. And uh, on the handout, here's a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth sublation. And as you can see, they rapidly get quite complicated in terms of the causal structure. And each nth order sublation defines a 
two n dimensional coupled system of differential equations. And, and obviously the fluctuations become increasingly complex. Um, if you want to pass this one around again, this is, this is <laughs> the, first, the first six Hegelian whole numbers in a simulated unity. Um, it's quite pleasant to watch that one. So every time we um, apply the simulation operator, we create a high dimensional dynamic system. <laughs> there are those videos on the internet of the best GIFs to just watch, the most satisfying GIFs or something. Yeah, I think that, 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 that's good make this. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like a kick. Yeah. But we don't have to stop there either. Um, we can split all the, all the way to infinity. Uh, so let's do the following. Let's sublate the Hegelian integers to create an infinite dimensional uh, dynamic system. So traditionally, we think of the um, integers as the infinite set. One, two, three. Yeah, an infinite set. That's what we normally think of them. Each number is a static quantity uh, that relates to its other members via arithmetic operations. 2 plus 2 plus 5. That's the relationship between members and members. But we can equally think of the integers as the sublated Hegelian integers, um, which would be essentially this. I'm using this, this symbol for sublation operation. Members relate to each other sort of via causal relationships, and this, the whole sublation moves um, as we see. Um, <clears throat> I think I do need to write this down, so bear, bear with me. So we can, in fact, formally solve. Um, the infinite sublation of the Hegelian integers. So essentially we can write it like this. We sublate all the way to infinity, and we get infinite, infinite dimensional dynamic system. Take it from me, can solve it for being, and it turns out that it's in an infinite sum of um, this thing, it's just this sort of scale, it's a scale, an infinite Sublate, uh, infinite um, um, sum of cosines and nothing is an infinite sum there's a minus sign here an infinite sum of sines which is, it just replicates the same structure of an individual contradiction it's actually fairly simple you, you add an infinite number together and that's what the dynamics are an infinite superposition of Um, so, this infinite dynamic system is a Hegelian view of the integers, and so are there any advantages of thinking about hn rather than n? And in fact, we already know the answer, and the answer is yes, because what we can show is that Riemann's revolutionary new way of looking at the integers embodied in his zeta function is precisely uh, this Hegelian viewpoint. Um, now, of course, Riemann. Um, nor any modern mathematician adopts a Hegelian interpretation of their mathematics. Nonetheless, the zeta function is a method for exploring the dynamics of the sublated totality of the Hegelian integers. Um, so the zeta function is actually full of being and nothing and becoming. It's full of contradictions, full of movement. So allow me to take a few moments to demonstrate that connection. Uh, HN is a dynamic system that Riemann's zeta function is a static timeless map that takes points on the complex plane to points on the complex plane. What have these things got to do with each other? So the first step um, is to map Hegel's being to the real number line. Um, and 
and that Hegel's nothing to the imaginary um, uh, number line. So this is now the complex plane. And I'm going to say nothing is going to be up on this axis. And being is going to be on this axis in the complex plane. So I'm actually forming a complex number which is x t plus i y t. I'm tying the nothing part of that imaginary number. <coughs> uh, Chain is a dynamic system that evolves with time. So, in mathematical terms, T is a sort of free parameter to the system. And I also introduce another free parameter, which is this lambda, which is for the whole, so it sets the size of the whole sublation. It's just a parameter. Turn it up, everything gets big, turn it down, everything gets small. That's what's happening here with that, that lambda parameter that I introduced. Um, and it controls the quantity of substance that flows in the whole system. Uh, so in the second step, we're going to represent the time and the scale of the sublation as another complex number. So here, we're going to have scale of the system. I should have written being nothing. Scale. Now time. Time and scale. Um, and um, this is another complex number. And then I'm going to define a function. Let's say this is s equals lambda plus i t, point in the complex plane. And this is an output. Now this is input. This is output. Function of s will map points to points. It's coming clearer where we're going. And so this function of fs is um, a mapping from scale and time to the activity level of being and nothing. And what we're essentially doing is using a, a complex value function to embed the dynamics of HN in the complex plane for all possible scales and for all possible time. So Earlier we viewed a complex value function like the zeta function as a mapping from complex plane points to complex plane points. That's a very syntactic or mathematical point of view. And this Hegelian interpretation gives us a different way of thinking about it, about some complex value functions. They tell us that the state of being in nothing, they tell us this complex value function tells us the state of being in nothing at a specific scale, at a specific time. So that's a bit more poetic kind of interpretation of the mathematics. There are some additional mathematical technicalities to do that embedding, which I'm simply not going to mention at the moment. I'm just going to gloss over. But the upshot is, in order for this to actually be a function of one complex number, and for this to be a, um, give finite values over the whole complex plane, what was an arbitrary choice becomes actually a necessary choice for this particular scaling factor here. So that's a technicality that is not so important. It might be very important mathematically, not so important for the point I want to make. So we've nearly got there, uh, um, we're getting there. So the last step is that we're not going to look at uh, HN. <laughs> After all, we're going to look at H log N. We're going to take the logarithm of the integers. Um, and why? Uh, well, because that allows us to actually map to the zeta function. But the real reason is logs give us um, turn uh, multiplication into addition, so it's a more convenient way of thinking about more multiplicative structure. So it's the log of the Hegelian integers. And so um, what that means is if you put log n here, push this through, do this mapping, which I won't do, but what we get, well it's on the sheet, we get this, I won't, we get the log of, so later you can see the log of the Hegelian integers is essentially the Riemann zeta function. So 
So that's the, the same object. Um, so in the handout, when we traversed um, this blue input line and got this spiral out, what we can now understand is that by setting the x value here, we're setting a scale for the sublation. As we travel up, we're just moving time forwards. And the output is the trajectory of this sublation in, in phase space, of the fluctuations of being and nothing. Right. Uh, ah, yes. Um, I hope you're ready for just one more. This is, in fact, the log of the Hegelian integers uh, to infinity uh, moving. And if you look carefully at time about 14.1, it goes through zero. <laughs> <laughs> Slight lie because I can only compute the first ten, not all infinity. I think it's slightly lucky it goes to zero. And then as you move forward, the approximation breaks down. Um, so, in this Hegelian interpretation, what are uh, the zeta zeros? What are these zeros? Um, so, Hegel's metaphysical bedrock was pure being and pure nothing. Uh, pure being, as I argued last time, in a sense explodes to infinity, and pure nothing implodes to nothing. So these pure states can't exist uh, in isolation, they're unstable. Hence we have becoming, a sublated unity, which exhibits both order and disorder. Now Hegel, in his logic, continues uh, and claims that becoming must individuate into separate things uh, which relate to each other in sublated unities of higher and higher complexity. And this universal process finally culminates in a state of absolute knowledge, uh, which overcomes the original contradiction between being and nothing, and where, according to him, God finally comes to fully know itself. And so in Hegel's philosophy, there's some kind of limit or end point of final reconciliation. And perhaps surprisingly, the mathematics of the zeta function has a similar structure. Uh, mathematically, as we sublate the Hegelian integers, the log of the Hegelian integers, they become increasingly causally entwined, and we create higher and higher complexity. And the zeta function encodes the limit of that process. And it exhibits both order and disorder. In fact, the fluctuations of being and nothing are chaotic in the strictly mathematical sense. The disorder of the infinite sublation is more disorderly than any single component. Uh, but order emerges from this chaos. It seems that the zeta function generates trajectories that for forever fluctuate around a special zero state. And this zero state is very special indeed. In the Hegelian interpretation, a zeta zero is a moment when both being and nothing are identically zero. <coughs> Or if we apply that reciprocal map from last time, a moment when they're identically infinite. So either the final lights in this infinite sublation blaze as bright as they possibly could, or they go completely dark. Um, and that, that means that we can say the zeros of the zeta function are moments in time when becoming, which is an infinity of contradictions, attains a state of pure being or pure nothing. And the, any individual contradiction can't do that. So the order manifested by the infinite sublation is more orderly than any single component. Uh, but these pure states of perfect order are achieved by infinite chaos. So again, they're unstable and therefore transitory and now merely moments of an infinitely complex process that become a lot of properties are reproduced uh, right at the end. So Riemann, in his uh, amazing paper, demonstrated the zeros in code distribution of the prime numbers. And the primes are irreducible atoms of the number system. They're the kind of mathematical bedrock. And Hegel's logic implies that these zeros are moments when uh, becoming reduces to pure being or pure nothing. So the zeros represent the irreducible atoms of Hegel's logic. And they're kind of metaphysical bedrock. 
So we can think of the primes as a kind of arithmetic expression of a kind of metaphysical perfection or kind of simplicity. So let's return now to the questions that uh, originally posed, uh, which is can we make sense of Riemann's revolution and why the zeta function is so successful in revealing hidden properties of the primes? And I think it's pretty clear that there's more questions than answers, obviously, but we can make some general remarks. When Riemann moved number theory into the complex plane, it revealed entirely new phenomena which have yet to be fully understood. And the success of this project, I think, is strong evidence that the whole numbers which we think of as static and unchanging entities, are really some kind of shadow or projection of, of the Hegelian in, integers. The zeta function reveals more because it represents what whole numbers actually are. That is a dynamic contradiction of being a nothing. But in addition, uh, the zeta function represents whole numbers as a sublater unity where the entities internally relate to each other by the exchange of the conserved substance. And this whole moves and changes with time. And that's quite unlike the vision offered by set theory. Now, in the 1970s, physicists noticed that the distribution of the zeta zeros uh, follows the same statistical law as the distribution of energy levels in some systems of subatomic particles. In fact, it's got a famous conjecture in, in physics of number theory. Um, <clears throat> and for many, this connection was uh, surprising and shocking because there seems to be no reason why physics and number theory should be so intimately connected in this way. But Hegel would fully expect to find such connections for the simple reason that he believed that thought and being are identical and conform to the same underlying laws, laws which he um, attempted to elucidate in uh, the science of logic. So obviously Hegel's logic uh, didn't invent analytic number theory, uh, or fundamental theories of physics, uh, but Hegel's logic implies that harmonic phenomena are a necessary consequence of a fundamental ontological contradiction uh, between being and nothing. And so this appearance in the most fundamental structures of physical reality uh, of harmonics and most fundamental structures of platonic thought is perhaps a remarkable and, and uh, comprehensive clue that Hegel's logic is, is probably a logic worth having. So that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Well, if not, I will ask um, Ian to respond in a second. Um, but before I do, uh, just an announcement. Um, the next next week's meeting is going to be here, same time, um, or same place, same room, uh, and the uh, title of that meeting is Christopher Corgo, 1907 to 1937, and the sources of poetry. Okay, Christopher Corgo, 1907 to 1937, and the sources of poetry, and then the following week same time, same place, it's going to be television, remote control. So I urge people to come along to one or both of those. And uh, Ian, if you want to... Yeah, I'll try. So, uh, Zed, you asked, is, is this important or is it... We didn't say this bit, or is it rubbish? You didn't say that. <laughs> uh, but, um, well, I think it's it's at the very least it's interesting from the point of view of um, tr tr trying to explain the ubiquity of harmonic phenomena. Sometimes you don't notice the wood for the trees. And the, the, the obvious thing that is so obvious, actually, especially when you look into physics, so, so obvious, it's harmonic oscillators all the way down. Um, and it's so obvious no one asks, well, what, why should that be the case? Why couldn't it be otherwise? I mean, and one of the reasons would be um, because um, that's the necessary structure of existence, according to Hegel's uh, metaphysical argument. That's quite interesting. And um, then the test that, that today's talk was, does that also apply to not physical phenomena, but also um, very abstract uh, mathematical thought? And um, 
on condition that you accept this mathematical interpretation of Hegel's logic, then the answer is, is yes, it definitely does, in a surprising and very um, direct uh, way. And then um, it gives a different way of looking. You know, every year, 10, 20, 30, 40 papers pr proving Riemann's hypothesis false. A smaller number giving a, a new interpretation of the zeta function. So this isn't like people do this all the time. This is a new interpretation of mathematics. Now, mathematics, I found sometimes um, uh, quite um, soulless in the sense that um, it's very syntactical. Uh, it, it can be anyway. There's loads of operations you can apply in the search space, and you apply them and you find a useful theorem. And obviously with huge search spaces, what you need is some kind of heuristics to prune the space in order to direct your search. And that's why interpretations of mathematics like this can be useful to give you a new view on the thing and say, well, if it is exact, if I want to think of this mathematics in this way, then a natural question is this, and it might lead to uh, new thoughts or ideas about the mathematics. Um, You mentioned it was weird, it's hard to think about uh, charm and strangeness and beauty and truth and spin of these fundamental... Uh, and yes, it, uh, it is, it's very alien and it's not, it's not uh, linked to our normal everyday experience. And so Hegel, um, not disparagingly, I think just accurately says that, uh, according to him, logic up to his science of logic was all about ordinary logic, ordinary consciousness, the kind of logic that we... It's like folk logic, formalized, of course, and um, sort of exoteric logics. But his speculative logic meant to be esoteric. It's meant to be getting behind or underneath what we take as granted. Um, and therefore, it is of nece necessity um, quite alien and strange. Uh, it would expect it to be. Uh, uh, Richard, you asked about uh, the, the or orderliness and the disorder in the primes. So I, I deliberately avoided talking about randomness. If you read a lot of stuff on primes, there's a lot of talk about randomness. And uh, I think you can have useful heuristic random arguments, but it's not, it's not a random phenomenon. It's a simple computer program will generate the primes. The, so the question is, um, yes, there is some irreducible computational work that probably we can't get away from to predict the next prime. But the point is, we're looking, we're kind of zooming out and looking for some law-like uh, gross properties. We're not trying. To, we're not. The prime number theorem isn't trying to predict the precise positioning of the primes. It's distributional phenomena. It's essentially what it's about. And the Riemann hypothesis, if it was true, would give a tighter bound on the distributional phenomena of the primes. Uh, that's what the mathematicians are trying to do. Um, uh, you also asked, uh, what is is this the only way of, of making numbers dynamic? And is there any, essentially, is there any necessity to uh, this derivation? And the answer is um, yes and no, because what we're doing essentially is looking at different sources of evidence. We're looking at Hegel's logic, uh, his, his metaphysical arguments as a source of evidence. We're looking at Riemann's work in mathematics and the zeta function as a source of evidence. And we're looking at fundamental physical phenomena as a source of evidence, and essentially trying to tie them all together as a, as a, in a unified theme, which would be a Hegel science of logic or maybe a formalised version. That's the attempt to try and unify all these things together. And um, we can't expect that the unification is, exists or is perfect or doesn't have massive gaps. Uh, which, so at the moment, the necessity isn't fully there. Um, one of the things is, it's not very Hegelian, is it, really, to have time and scale as well as being in nothing. Really, time and scale should also reduce to being in nothing. Um, it shouldn't really be inputs and outputs. It should be just inputs. You know, it should feed back. So you know, lot, it, it doesn't fully fit together. But what, what we're trying to do is, 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 is map Hegel's logic to the, the Riemann zeta function. And with a little bit of um, arbitrary choices at some of the points, managed to tie them together. It'd been much better to not have any arbitrariness at all. But I think if, if you had that, you would 
probably a higher state of enlightenment than I could imagine. <laughs> uh, that would be great. Um, and f finally, um, my, my, your point about uh, what does this mean about time uh, and, and, and process philosophy, uh, and I, I think I, I can't really answer your question, but um, the idea of time and an instant of time is, of course, very uh, subtle anyway from just the physical evidence because the perfect vacu quantum vacuum, the zero point energy, um, it's, it's, a, it's a harmonic oscillator where, where particles pop into existence and pop out of existence. You cannot have, even at zero temperature, there's still movement according to quantum mechanics. So even there, the, mm. the, an instant of time is, is not well defined in the way that corresponds to ordinary um, consciousness. I think that's it. Yeah. Thanks.